Janet Meek, I am so excited that you've joined me today. I've just finished reading your amazing book on birth, the wild and sacred. I never knew anything could be so exciting about giving birth, or as you like to call it, catching a child. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means? Well, Tristan, I've done many things in my life. I've, uh, I've had a very high-powered career in the State Department. Um, I've been a mother to three boys, and nothing matches the mystery and the, the absolute stunning reality of the birth of a child. And so um, I believe this is something that that we as women need to bring some attention to. Um, the, the, the struggles I had as a young woman were how to, to gain access to a career that was very dominated by men and how to succeed at that career. And I did that, but the, uh, along the way, I had a family. And I realize there are a lot of challenges out there for women um, when they give birth to children. So the standard terminology for, give, for having a baby in a hospital is the doctor delivers the baby. Right. But when I later had my own children, two of them at home, mm -hmm. and then became a midwife, we referred to it as catching babies, giving credit to the mother who had actually delivered the baby. Or as in Spanish, this beautiful term, it's not to deliver the baby or catch the baby, it's mm -hmm. dando luz, dando la luz or dando luz. It means giving light. Wow. So a term that brings in more the, the spiritual and the, the contribution of the mother to the birth process rather than a product that's being produced or delivered through her body. Well, Janet, I hear how passionate and, and joyous you are about your career as a midwife, and it certainly is reflected in your book, but you were so successful, and you were right on this wonderful, financially secure path in your career. What, what inspired you to walk away from it and, and become a, a midwife? Well, actually, I walked away from it to be with my son. Oh. Um, I thought that I was, you know, a committed career woman um, and that I would have a nanny, which I did for, yeah. for some years. Um, but when I got my son home for the first time and unwrapped that blanket mm. and looked at him and realized I hadn't even counted his fingers and toes, and I started just like getting to know my baby and mm. something came over me. It was a very powerful feeling. And um, I started weeping. Oh. And I said to him, I would do anything in the world for you. And so I continued with my career for another two years, a very intense career. It took me away from him a lot. Um, and, but my mother's heart, I also nursed him as a working mom, and mm -hmm. I was very close to him. And eventually my heart just took me elsewhere. You know, I wanted to be with my child. I wanted to be there when he said his, when he asked questions like, what is God? You know, I wanted to be there for that. And so I, um, I became a stay-at-home mom mm -hmm. for 19 years raising my first son and having two more and raising them. And in the process, mm -hmm. I discovered um, home birth and that eventually when my children were older and they were in school, led me to become a midwife to help other women have that experience. So what I'm hearing you say is that your experience giving birth in your home was so phenomenal and it, treat, it touched you so deeply that you wanted to share that with other women. You wanted to be a part of that. Yes. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't as much about um, the babies as it was about what I began to feel as a woman giving birth 
I guess you could say, under my own power, with no interventions um, and no drugs, and how, uh, and the, the experience of my child after birth, it was this feeling of, well, when, you know, after I did that, it's like nothing would f be difficult again. It was like this, the, it was a big, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, mm -hmm. or, or just it was so wonderful, yeah, you know? Yeah, I don't yeah. want to glamorize birth without medication, but, there was so much I got from it. There was this sense of, of um, empowerment. And then there was this gift of the timelessness that happened with my babies born at home after the birth. I'm hearing empowerment. And this is the time of the woman. And it always has been. But I love that in your book you keep coming back to the empowerment of women and trusting your instinctual self. And in, in our world today, um, especially in birthing, and I know that's rough, and you explain how that's relatively new, um, going to a hospital and being, um, basically being part of a system. Mm -hmm. And what I love about reading your book is how it's about your own trusting in your instinctual self, and like you just said, empowerment of yourself. What have you seen in your years of um, midwife that um, speaks strongest to you about empowerment of women? Well, let me just say I'm not against hospital birth, but I do think that we do things in our uh, medical model of birth mm -hmm. that um, are not fully supportive of the mother giving birth and may even inadvertently interfere in the birth process. And so I'm going to take your question a little bit different direction than empowerment. Okay. I'm going to take it in the direction of, you know, I've been very fortunate in that I have seen truly natural, unmedicated birth mm -hmm. in several hundred births. Now, wow. there are midwives out there who've done a lot more births than me, but I have seen, it's, it's kind of like being able to, sit at the knee of Mother Nature and wow. learn from that. And so there are, if you think about the process of birth, um, we, we tend to not trust it in our society. We tend to maybe even fear it. There's so many uh, people who uh, will spread that fear to a, an expectant mom. It's strange how that happens. Yeah. But we have, we have in a bit of cultural arrogance that's now spread around the world thought that we could improve on Mother Nature. What happens when you do that with the process of birth is that you can inadvertently actually cause problems. How's that? What kind of problems? Well, think about our ancient mothers, our ancient mother ancestors, mm. and they were giving birth in the wild. And they were, at times, in need of having to flee from a wild animal or from um, an, you know, some danger in their environment. Mm -hmm. So the process that evolved within us for giving birth had a way of shutting it down. Um, so if a mother is suddenly fearful or stressed, she she has a fight or flight response. And we'll go, maybe go into the biochemistry of that a little bit later, because there's an actual biochemistry involved. Okay. But she has the capacity through the fight or flight response to shut her labor down and run away, for the labor to stop and for her to run away and the birth can resume later. So um, I'm indebted for my, to, my understanding of this to Dr. Michel Odon. He's a French obstetrician, and he in, became a great friend of midwives, and uh, a personal friend. And he is fond of explaining to his medical colleagues how this all works. He says, in a room full of doctors and maybe nurses, you know, he will say, in this very thick French accent, he will say, what is the most important organ in the process of birth? And long pause, and your mind is thinking of different things. You're like, 
uterus, ovaries, and he would say, the brain, the brain, you know. And but then he goes on to explain, it's not the the thinking part of the brain, it's the autonomic part of the brain, the brain as a gland, secreting the birth hormones. So we have a symphony of hormones that are secreted during the birth process. No one knows exactly what initiates it, um, but when the birth process starts, it's, it's a cascade of hormones that start flowing in the mother. Oxytocin, which makes the uterus contract, um, and uh, uh, the uh, endorphins, which are natural painkillers, and they flood the body. Um, but in order for the autonomic part of the brain to go into action like that and really make the process work, mm -hmm. you need to reduce neocortical stimulation. The neocortex is this logical thinking part of the brain. And it's very highly developed in our modern society. But you actually have to get out of the thinking part of your brain, the fearing part of the brain, the stressful uh, part of the brain in order for the autonomic system to work. And if you are not uh, uh, comfortable and uh, you know, feel safe and secure, you will inhibit the birth process with a natural flow of the opposite kinds of hormones, the catecholamines, the stress hormones that our ancient mothers developed over many thousands of maybe millions of years that would shut down the birth process. So do you see how this works? I do, I do. I love how you explained it and included something, my favorite part of the book, is when you talked about the birth is like, can I say it, like a sexual experience. And almost like, you have a phrase in it that I just love, and it's what, I'm not gonna say this right, so please correct me is what, what, made, what put the baby in is what gets the baby out. Is that something accurate? Can you explain that a little bit further? Well, first let me attribute that to the midwives at the farm, Ina Mae Gaskin and the midwives that have been get, doing out of hospital unmedicated births at the farm in Tennessee for many years. Are you talking about the farm, the community, the farm? Right. Oh, I love that. Right. Yeah. And, and it, th these were women that um, wanted the natural process. They wanted to honor the natural process. And they started attending each other's births. Well, they've had quite a history now, maybe 30 years, and they have some of the best birth statistics in the, in the, the world and in the country. Um, their C-section rate is less than 2% for 3,000 births. Wow. And so, What's going on with that? Well, one of the things that the, the farm midwives discovered is that if, that a, if you uh, uh, encourage the birthing couple, including the father, to um, go in a nice dark place and cuddle together and maybe smooch a little, um, and that, that this encourages the birth process. Wow. So we're also talking about reducing the thinking part of the brain. And, and of course, with any kind of an autonomic process, whether it's, um, you know, our digestion or, um, or even more personal things, um, you need this feeling of not being observed, right? So, so when a woman um, or a man feels observed, it's very difficult to have any kind of a natural um, autonomic process take place. It shuts it down, right? Yeah. We know that. Like, I'm yeah. not going to get too graphic here, but we know. Well, even going to the bathroom. I don't want to be observed going to the bathroom. Right. Taking, right. Yeah. So if you add to that the, the sexual dimension, I mean, you wouldn't want people observing you having sex, right? Right. Of course not. And the the... the if you think of, uh, well, Dr. O'Donnell has coined the term fetus ejection reflex. The fetus ejection reflex can happen during second stage under the right conditions, 
um, as a kind of orgasmic experience of birth where the baby just flies out. It doesn't happen in every birth, but it's something that we midwives love to cultivate is, you know, instead of making it happen, you know, letting it happen, building the energy, building the, the it, it's hard to believe that could actually be part of birth, isn't it? Because we have such a different idea of birth. It's like push, 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 you know, and, and straining and, and um, you know, that, that pushing stages that go on for two hours sometimes. And if you don't get a, the baby out in two hours, then they turn to C-section. Well, how much better would it be to cooperate with, with this other dimension of birth, the wild side of birth, if you will? We're talking, when, when I say birth wild and sacred. Yeah, what does that mean? The wild part has to do with um, returning um, to our natural instincts and in intuition and letting go of all these constraints. Like a woman who is giving birth um, naturally tends to shed all her clothes. Um, she sheds her inhibitions. She may shout. She may curse. You know, all of this needs to be allowed. It's a, it's a, because being uninhibited and it helps the birth process. You know, but um, as you are probably aware, the hospital environment restricts a lot of that. Every woman who gives birth in a hospital is treated like a, um, a surgical patient. She can't eat or drink. Well, giving birth. You don't necessarily want to eat a lot, but you need to keep your energy up if it goes on for some hours, you know. So already you're interfering with the birth process. And I'm a ranch girl from Texas, okay. We know in animal husbandry that if you interfere with a birthing animal mother, you can really uh, cause a greater rate of stillbirth. You can stop the labor. You know, so farmers and ranchers, they know to leave things alone unless there's a crisis. And that, I believe, is why places like the farm have uh, such amazing birth statistics, because they're honoring the natural process and they're not interfering with it. Even things that we think might add to safety, like a fetal monitor. Yeah. But study after study has shown that it makes birth less safe, because... Um, well, you're, the mother has less mobility. She has a strap around her abdomen, or maybe she has intermittent monitoring, but if she's hooked up to a monitor, she can't move around very much. And there are all these bells and whistles going off, and she doesn't know what they all mean. If she turns over on her side, it may set a bell and a whistle off. And then she's worried for the baby. So you see, then she's thinking, and she's out of, it pulls her out of the the natural autonomic process, the wild process that she is, needs to be in to get that baby up. I have a question too, is there's a famous thing that we all hear about in cartoons in almost every movie where you take the baby and you smack him on the butt right away. What do you think about that? Well, uh, that used to be the, the, the way that we thought we had to treat babies in order to get, be sure they took their first breath. Right. But um, there was a, a, that's gone by the wayside, luckily. You know, it, in my generation of mothers, they were still doing that. But we, uh, there was a Dr. Le Boyer that pioneered a water bath for baby. I've heard that. And uh, birth without violence. So, you know, he said it was a very cruel thing to hold a baby up by its feet when it's been curled in the womb and suddenly the spine is straight, you know, that that was shocking, not to mention the cold on the baby's skin. And so I think, I don't think there are doctors really that are following that practice anymore, but midwives, I don't believe, ever endorse that. We were more about gently bringing the baby to the mother's breast right away, still attached to the cord. The baby's still getting a lot of, of uh, blood that he needs from the pulsing cord. You wait till it stops pulsing to clamp and cut the cord. Um, but the warmth of the mother and the skin on skin with the baby, and this is the perfect 
distance for the mother and the baby to look into each other's eyes and for that maternal bond with the baby to form, the love bond. And there are experts now that believe, well, Dr. O'Don is one of them, who believes that that, that early bonding with the mother has everything to do with a person's capacity to love later in life.